everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. When did the desire of an African American child to rise above his or her circumstances through education translate into acting white? How does a young person cope when they face racism from society and rejection from their own? It's a phenomenon rarely discussed outside the black community, but many young, gifted, and black children have been and are ostracized by their own people because they are smart. Arthur Jeffrey Blount brings this issue to light in his book, The Emancipation of Evan Walls. And we'll talk about it next on Another View, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Before we get started in our great conversation this afternoon with author Jeffrey Blunt, I'm going to tell you about an event that is happening at the Z in Virginia Beach. It's a performance called Cross That River, and it's written by Alan Harris, who is a renowned jazz musician and author, and he talks about Bluesy, the slave who escaped and traveled west after crossing the Gabine River and becoming a black cowboy. Boy. And so really interesting black history for us. It's going to be at the Z on one night only. That is February the 8th at 7.30 p.m. It's in partnership with the Virginia African American Cultural Center. And if you want more information, you can visit them at aaccvb.org. That's aaccvb.org. So go check it out and uh, enjoy. So The Emancipation of Evan Walls is a fictional story of an African-American boy who finds himself in limbo in the segregated town of Canaan, Virginia. Targeted by whites who don't want integration and resented by his family and friends because he dreams of a better life. Where does he fit in? How does he cope with the accusation from his community that he's not black enough? Arthur Jeffrey Blunt is with us. He's an award-winning author, contributor to publications like HuffPost, The Washington Post, and TheGrio.com, and a former director for NBC News. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you? Uh, hi, Barbara. Thank you for having me. I'm <laughs> thank so honored you. to be on your show. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. But I am so excited about this book. Now, I have to tell you that when I promoted the, the um, conversation that we're having today, um, in the the subject line for the e-newsletter we send out, I put the words acting white. And I got a lot of response back. I'm not and surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and most African Americans that responded knew exactly what I was talking about and, and you know were interested in what we were going to discuss about it. But from some for a lot of white people I heard, I don't understand. What does that mean? Give us an explanation. What do you? Th- what does that mean? Acting white. Acting white. <clears throat> it means. Um, I, I thought basically your lead in was perfect, and it it ab- absolutely means a black person who is perceived to be living outside their culture, uh, doing things that are not consistent with how people think black people should act, mm-hmm. or and doing things that are perceived as white. The problem for Evan is. Something as simple as education, which at least in my lifetime, as a child, um, growing up with two parents who believed in education, we thought that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so to be in the mode of thinking I want to become educated and be somebody should be a good thing. Um, And Evan is just thrown, blindsided by the fact that it isn't. Tell us about Evan. You know, Mm -hmm. set the the stage for us a little bit so that people will understand um, what we're going to be discussing as we move forward. Evan is is a, a little boy. Um, he well, when we, the book opens, Evan is an adult, adult right. and mm-hmm. he and his wife have just had their first child, and he is frightened by the birth of this by of this child, uh, and not because of any of the number of things that could happen to her that we think about from you know cancer or get hit by a car or something like that. But he's afraid she will end up in a situation like he was in. And then we go back and we meet young Evan, and at 10 years old, uh, young, gifted, and black, as we used to say it back in the day. And that description puts him on a path between two very different worlds. 
um, the white community who believes he's the uppity inward and and how does he dare think he belongs in this community with us and then a black community that's afraid of of coming or on the other side of the the civil rights movement people have gone through everything from uh, being afraid of lynchings and church burnings and everything else and very afraid to step into white spaces because stepping into those spaces have been dangerous in the past. Mm -hmm. And here you find a little boy who's inspired to step into a space that at least the African-Americans in Canaan, and I say that in Canaan specifically because at one point he will visit Hampton Institute at the time and there'll be something different. Right. Mm -hmm. But those people he's, he's with are afraid of stepping into that space. Afraid and, of moving outside of their their place. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And as he talks about rising above that, he's inspired by this character of Bojack who gives a speech about how we need to be better. And Evan says, I want to step outside of that and grow. He gets blindsided by his own people who say, mm -hmm. don't rise above your raising, as we used to say, and stay in your place because that's where it's safe. On the other hand, Bojack is saying where it's safe is where they want you uneducated and not trying to go out and make changes in the world. And you can never make changes if you don't step out there exactly. and do something different. So you grew up in Smithfield. I did. So so this is home for you. Yes, yes, <laughs> Welcome home. Yes, and my brother, uh, <laughs> my older brother, went to Old Dominion University. Oh, right down see? The street, so, yeah. <laughs> so is, this, is part of this story a little autobiographical? It is. Um, and I certainly, as I grew up, um, uh, you know, I went through a painful period where um, I felt like I was not wanted in some spaces within my own community. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was hurtful. Um, but I managed to set that aside as I moved forward. And I would never have written the book because of my own experiences. Mm -hmm. It was experience of another little boy that caused me to write the book. Um, also 10 years old, this little boy um, is the reason Evan starts out at 10. Mm. So it's in the mid 80s. Um, I'm reading the paper. There's an African-American reporter, a guy who has been staying in public housing. Mm -hmm. And he's writing about experiences in public housing and, and things we should know about how people live. And he comes across this story about this 10-year-old boy who is brilliant by all accounts, just loves going to school, gets straight A's, and he pays for it on the way home every now and then by getting beat up by mm -hmm. kids in his own community. So the reporter tracks down the family and he goes and he talks to the mom and he says, you know, I'm trying to be objective, but I was upset by what I heard is happening to your son. I know it must be hard for him to continue to want to be do what he's doing because mm -hmm. um, he's getting beat up. And I know it must be really difficult for you to see your son going through that. And she says something like, um, I wish he would just be a janitor or something like everybody else and stop causing me so much trouble. Mm. And that came out of nowhere for me because I had set all that aside. And it, it, it hit me, you know, like people say, a Mack truck hit you. Mm -hmm. And I kept carrying this boy with me and thinking about that. And I remember driving to Smithfield and sitting down and talking to my mom, who was a teacher. And, of course, she had known what I'd been through. And she said, well, Jeffrey, you like to write. This is the story you should write. Wow. You should tell this story. And that was the genesis. You know, Jeff, it's, it's very interesting. But people don't understand, I think, how segregation truly impacted our community yes. um, internally yes. Um, because because of the fear. And I'm glad you brought up that word fear because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people think, well, they just want to be lazy. They just want to kick back and do nothing. Right. They were, you know, but there was genuine fear of what would happen if you tried to go above your place, if you tried to move out of the, the boundaries for which you were set. Right. Um, not, and not only that, but there was also the fear of the unknown because I, we were kept separate for so, so long, long. And then all of a sudden, there's integration. That's okay, right. go to school with white kids. That's right. And nobody <laughs> there to guide you. So as right. a child, you go to school, and it's like Evan, and the night before they go, he and his brother, are you know, they're afraid because they know, and Mama Jenny, Evan's great-grandmother, great says to him, and I think a very emotional point, when he says, well, what if they do something to me? And she says, there's nothing I can do to help you. Wow. And so when you take you put that mindset and a child and a child goes off to school and sits in this room with all these people who he perceives to be there to do harm to him. Well, and I mean, he goes and he sits down in the classroom. Um, the teachers don't believe that he belongs there. Right. Um, you know, and, and people think because this is 2020 that this isn't still happening. That's right. 
and it is still happening. Yeah, and and that's and the the, the constant battle of of fighting institutional racism is a day to day weight on people. Um, and <clears throat> when I think back to integration and getting on that school bus with my brothers and 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 making that first foray into this world of where you weren't sure of how people were going to um react to react you to. it was it was you know it was unsettling and and that's and i guess that's an understatement and so it took you a while just to get yourself together before you could even concentrate on doing yeah. your schoolwork and then you had to be afraid of that white teacher whether or not she was going to like you whether or not she was going to even if you got a good grade you did would she grade your paper correctly exactly all those things are flying around in your head and you're just a little kid and then you're looking over here and the kid next to you is, is saying bad things about your hair and your face and all this stuff. And, so, and then you go home and your mother and father is saying to you, why can't you just be like everybody why else? Why can't you be like everybody else and stop causing me trouble? <laughs> and stop causing me trouble. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and the book set it up, the the family. So so Evan Wall's family was a prominent family yes. in Canaan. Yes, yes. And I, you know, coming out of all of that, and being able to create something for yourself, or in in their in this family's case, even if it was given to you, you you still own it, you still have it, you have this place of respect and authority within the community. Mm -hmm. um, you have all these people who come to your house because they to, actually to, own land. They own land, and yeah. and they actually leased land to others. That's right. Um, to share crop. That's right. And so then to have everybody come to you to sort of uh, to on come porch. on your porch and yes. talk. <laughs> And so coming to your porch is coming to the king's court. And and then when Evan puts them in a position where he could cause their um, kingdom to crumble, it's a very difficult thing mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And they don't have, they have trouble finding the strength to stand behind their child's dreams when it puts their kingdom in jeopardy. I, I loved how you used um, English. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, because your character spoke the way that that Southern um, black spoke. Right. You know, back in the 60s and, and, and 50s and so forth. Um, and but can you describe for us the conversation, the, the coming out when when Evan screamed, I want to be somebody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, As a matter of fact, I think I've got it here. <laughs> well, I will first tell you that um, I really needed to write it that way because I wanted to be authentic about the time and about the people and the cadences of life that I knew and understood. Mm -hmm. And I know that, um, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Barracoon came out recently as a book about the slave who, who spoke in dialect and she refused to allow it to be published back in, I think it was either thirties or forties. Yeah. Yes. Right. Because they wanted it to be, milk turned into something less than authentic. And um, so when I, when I was showing friends this, they reminded me of that and they said, well, were you a little bit um, worried about using the dialect? And I said, no, because this is the truth. This mm -hmm. is, when you talk about whether the Jackson 5 was your, the music of your youth or Earth, Wind and Fire, whatever, this was the music of my youth, sitting and listening to the adults talk and listen to the rhythm of how they spoke. Um, and I wanted that to be a part of it. And it comes out on that porch in the very first, very first chapter. I bring it out in full force because yeah. when he stands up and tells them, you know, he wants to, I want to be somebody, you know, one of the first responses is, boy, you, you know, older than a minute. Sit down. Exactly. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> sit down and shut up. Right. And, and yeah. then they turned off and said, well, what are you saying? That we're nobody? That, that's right. That's right. You know, and so that immediately he he got slapped. You That's know. right. And he didn't really know how to handle it. He's 10 years old. He just announced his dream. And then they tell you that your dream means that we're nobody. Yeah. And that's not at all what he's trying to say, but that's how it's twisted. But I think that's also part of the fear we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when, I, when I'm writing it, I'm writing, I'm thinking they are not only afraid um, or angry at him, they are afraid for him. And they don't even know how to say that. Because if he steps out there, like Mama Jenny says to him later, there's nothing we can do to save you. So, boy, you better be aware 
on what you're doing, mm-hmm. you know. You know, when and uh, there was a, a woman who was the superintendent of schools, of the black schools. Yes. Um, who, who basically had to announce to the black churches in Canaan that, uh, segre- I mean, that uh, desegregation was coming. Right. And that their kids were going to have to go to school with white kids. Right. And the reaction of the parents, what did she do to us? Right. Right. You know, was just was just phenomenal to me. Well, I it, when when this was happening in in uh, Smithfield, because I started out in segregated schools and went to, I noticed that there was even at that age a wide range of thoughts in the African American community, mm-hmm. and one of those one line of thought was exactly that. You know what 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 are these people doing to us? What are they putting us into? I rem- I can't remember all the names of the people who were that I there were several people who I put together to create Eliza Blizzard. Eliza, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. and um and I remember at the time thinking of these towering figures, these black people who were fighting this war um, to end segregation and and end you know um, secondary schools. I mean schools that were 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 second to the the top tier schools and all of that. And, and being proud of that, but at the same time being confused by people who said, this isn't where we need to go, and other people who were saying, these people are wrong and they don't speak for me, and why do my kids have to end up in a space where, because they've decided they should be there. Um, so um, I often have had conversations with, with uh, African-American kids, sometimes when I speak at school and, and I, at, at schools, and I tell them you know, that there was a confusion at the time. Um, the right thing happened. The wave was moving with enough enough strength in my mind that the right thing happened. But mm-hmm. people were afraid, people mm-hmm. were scared, and people were confused about what was happening. But I also think it, it also goes to show you, um, and it's something that we try to do here on Another View, the fact that we are not, this our community is not a monolith. We, right. we have a variety of thought, and, and, and we react to circumstances in different ways based on the experiences. That's correct. That we have. Absolutely, absolutely. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. Have you had a chance to read The Emancipation of Evan Walls by Jeffrey Blunt? Um, and, And if you have not... Are you familiar with the terminology of acting white and what that means? Give us a call and let's talk about it. Has it ever happened to you? Has anyone ever accused you of acting white? 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. You know, it it really struck a chord with me. Two things um, that you said. One, um, I used to sit in my aunt's house on the steps, if you go down into the basement, there was a little ledge, and if you really, you know, kind of scoot yourself over, right. they couldn't see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you could sit and listen, and you're right. The cadence, right. the conversation, the and and that's kind of how a lot of how I learned, you know, what was going on in our community, right. what they were thinking about it, um, what was important and what wasn't, uh, and so that, and also. People used to tell me all the time that, you know, you're acting white. Uh, you know, you act white. Why do you speak so well? Yes. Why do you use the King's English? Why do you, you know, right. do those things? Right. And and um, it, it, it's disheartening in a sense, yes. but it's also, I used it as an opportunity to just turn it around and try to educate them, yes. you know, on the fact that, that uh, everybody just does what they do. And if right. school is your thing, there's nothing wrong with that. And you're, you're right, and and it should be as simple as that. And right. and 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 I wish that all kids were strong enough to do what you did and what I did, which was to meet it. And even if it caused you trouble, you're able to move through it. And I think I was able to do that one because I had unconditional love and support at home. Yeah, and to to start the start out in the world with that as your base is helps so much. Mm-hmm. And some of these kids whose stories I read about that I brought together to create Evan Walls didn't have that and they're out there on their own. Or some did have that, but the parents weren't even aware of what they were going through at school because the kids didn't want to talk about it. Um, and and so, I mean, Evan, he even lost, he lost his home. He lost he, his home. He, lost, he was living in, out in the woods. Yeah. I mean, he really went through a lot of changes. Now, I find it interesting that Evan had a white girlfriend. Yes. And so talk to me about that. Well, this is, I would think, um, one way I look at this is that this is the one silver lining of of Evan's story, if you can call it that. And I know it's, it, it takes people a while to get to the silver line. 
But if you, I heard a, I heard a quote the other day that just, uh, just stunned me, and I thought this is just beautiful. It said, "What if you were, an, uh, if you were exiled from your community, but still forced to live within it? Mm. How devastating would that be?" Mm. So if you had the ability to step outside of it, even for a little bit. So as Evan says, when he finally makes white friends, he's prepared himself. He gives himself a sentence to argue with the first black person that says, why are you f- friends? And he said, I went where I was wanted. But nobody ever asked him. <laughs> but he was prepared. <laughs> but that was, was right. right. That, and that's what he was. When... And, right. And so Evan, in his desperation to find some kind of friendship and and love or whatever amongst his friend amongst people his own age, mm-hmm. he begins to reach out to white kids um, when black kids won't accept him. Long story short, Evan, as an adult, would have friends of all nationalities and all races because once he stepped outside of that, he realized, oh, there are these two boys who are white. I was supposed to hate them, but guess what? They're actually nice. Yeah. You know, and they actually want to be my friend. And not only that. And they were his friend on the football team. On the football team. Mm -hmm. And not only that, they'll be walking down the hall with some people I know who are real racist. And they just, they will still wave to me. They'll still come and talk to me. They never ignore me. And then he said, oh, well, all these people aren't bad. So the next step is to allow yourself to become a part of that community for as much as you can. And that includes if you find somebody who will date you? You date them. You know, it's interesting because Bojack, yes. who, who was uh, um, was Evan's mentor, right. said at one point, if we step out and we learn about them, I mean, I'm paraphrasing right. here, then maybe you know, maybe our kids will become friends with their kids, and it'll make life better. Right. Um, and then he also said to um, Evan's girlfriend, you know, she said, "Do you hate black people? I mean, do, uh, do you hate white people?" And he said, "I don't hate you." Right. You know, which which to me just showed yet more progression in That's terms right. of of the races Beca- coming together. And because he had got he taken a minute to get to know her, he shared something with her, yes. cheering about the football game, and he and and through Evan's eyes, he learned something about her. So he learned too. Everybody's not evil. Everybody's not evil. Right. If you're just joining us, we're talking with our free author, Jeffrey Blunt. His book is called The Emancipation of Evan Walls. And we're talking about the phenomenon of being of being called acting white. Mike joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Mike. You're on the air. Uh, yes. Uh, hi. How you doing? OK. Um, I grew up in uh, Virginia Beach in a you know, predominantly white areas, probably 99.9 percent white. Um, <laughs> there was probably about six black families probably you know out of a thousand but Mm -hmm. i'm in my mid 50s and my brothers what they had to go through being that they're in their early 60s they went through the issues that that you know i didn't go through um but Mm. once i started going going to middle school you know black people used to say well why do you sound white (laughs) so me and my brothers had to you know younger brothers you know we had to deal with that aspect but the weird thing to me is that you know you know, since you were talking about him, you know, dating, um, you know, someone white. Mm-hmm. When I went to high school, the black guys that went to that grew up in a mostly black area dated white girls. Whereas me growing up in a white area, I only dated black girls, but they didn't have that respect for black women for some reason coming from a all black neighborhood. To me, I used to, you know, always joke with them. I'm like, why do you feel like that when you're when your uh, mother's black, I said, you're not <laughs> making any kind of sense, you know, the great and black woman like that. So to me, you know, it was kind of awkward me coming from seeing everybody as the same, but them not seeing, you know, not growing up with everybody. So I didn't value nobody, you know, any better than anybody else. Cause I didn't see anybody as being better than me, but maybe that's what right. they saw, you know, by the way that they were raised. Well, I have a question for you before you go, Mike, did, um, how did you cope? back in the community um so they if they ask you why do why are you speaking white um or whatever i mean when you went back home would you would you code switch would you go back into dialect what would you do no that wouldn't happen because see you know i didn't i didn't really you know come you know come in contact with a lot of black kids until i you know started middle school which was which was eighth you know you know eighth grade for me right so that's when you know i got the you know why do you sound white you know, that's what okay. I got, you know, from the black people that I played sports I with. But you. growing up, 
But, you know, growing up, I didn't have any issues because I was an athlete and my brothers, you know, we were athletes, so we just melted in with everybody else. So nobody really, you know, I, I was never disrespected, you know, for being black. You know, everybody treated me fine, so I didn't have any issues. But when I started going to middle school is when the black kids started questioning me. I'm like... You know, gotcha. what's wrong with okay. yeah. <laughs> you? Okay. Know, we you? got it. We got it. Mike, thanks so much for the call. We appreciate and, it. And is there, is there any way I can contact Mr. Blunt? Is there, is there any way that they have a, if any you, contact? Information? Yeah, if you go on my website, there is a contact uh, tab. And if you if you fill out that um, with your email and send that, then I will hear from you and I'll get back Tell to you. Tell us your website and address. www.jeffreyblunt.com. Okay, okay. Thank you. thanks so much for the okay. call. We appreciate it. You want to respond to Mike? Um, there was a lot there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mike, I think I think Mike um, also, you know, was speaking about a possibility of another book <laughs> when he was talking about, you know, um, the black men and black women and and the respect, you know, regular and respect. That. And mm-hmm. that's a that's a whole nother story um, and a worthy story. Um, but this is a, a, a bit different. And I, I and, you know. I have been at every different every different event I've been to where there have been African Americans. I've had someone do what Mike just did: step up and say, "I suffered through this too. I went through this." Um, and so I think it's more pervasive in the community than we um, want to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a painful thing to talk about, and I think um, that's part of it. And we don't want to admit that we do damage to each other sometimes. Yeah. And I do. And I think one of the main things that I've tried to have conversation with people about is that we spent so much time um, as a community doing what we should do, fighting institutional racism, which is the father of all of this. Evan's story is a subset of institutional racism. If we didn't have it, I wouldn't have have a story to write. Um, But one of the things we've done is we fought to to protect the community as a whole in terms of housing, education, health care. But we haven't focused on the psychological damage that individuals within the community uh, have suffered and what we might do to each other because we've been internalizing all of this bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what this book is trying to point to, too, is explaining that, you know, there's so many different things happening to us because of this battle that we're constantly in. And we have to recognize that, um, uh, we are absorbing bad things, just like a children raised in a family where there's violence between the parents. They absorb that. Exactly. And when they grow up, it shows up in their lives in different ways. Mm-hmm. And so this is what's happening. And um, Evan is trying to you know, f- figure that out. If you're just joining us, we're talking with author Jeffrey Blunt. His new book is called The Emancipation of Evan Walls, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. Has this ever happened to you? Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Thomas joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Thomas. You're on the air. Hi. How are you doing today? Okay. How are you? Good. I just want to uh, see if we um, can go back to the origin of the whole situation where we said being educated or talking a certain way is acting white or European. Um, We all know information has been colonialized or colonized. So who are the first educated people on this earth? Those are African people. Mm -hmm. But when we don't teach our true history, then we appropriate or misappropriate education or intelligence with being European or white or what have you. But we forget about the thousands of years of education prior to the Greeks and the Romans coming to Africa to learn. So our our people have been miseducated here and intentionally um, disconnected from true education. Mm-hmm. So you'll know that whatever language you're speaking may not be your native tongue, but you can speak several languages and you can speak them um, properly and, and not be uh, uh, afraid to do so. Mm-hmm. But it all goes back to the, to us not teaching what true education is. And that's the, the uh, acquired knowledge or information, you know, and giving this proper um, people who created the proper context. I grew up in, up North, moved down South and in my neighborhood up North, everybody was pushing to go and, and to be educated, not necessarily so they could uh, feel like they were white, but they knew that in a certain way that that's the way to beat the system within the system. Exactly. Mm, you know, got you. Yes. Yes. We didn't we, we didn't understand. So once we start teaching to the true origin of education, 
then we'll, we'll stop giving uh, 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 credit to the Europeans who were Johnny Come Lately's, you know, in the Caucasus Mountains. We educated them when they came to Africa, so the great empire there. So science, mathematics, all that stuff. Now, language is different. Now, our languages were different. There were so many uh, African nations. So, But, you know, if you're speaking English, then you're speaking the King James English. So that is uh, a sense of kind of losing your further assimilating into European culture. Sure. You know, Absolutely. That, that further assimilation, which was stripped also. When your humanity was stripped and, and, and slavery, then what little bit you had to hold on to, even if it was nothing more than, you know, something that wasn't, you know, too, too, too uh, worthy in society, but it was something that you could identify with being black. Okay, so. Thomas, thank you so much for the call. You have given us much food for yes. thought. We appreciate your phone call. Go ahead. Thomas, thank you for, <laughs> for that. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I, I, wanna, I, I taught a class at George Washington University uh, on Im- implicit bias in the media. And at one point, I put up a slide for the students to look at. And I said, describe this to me. And they say, well, it looks like people in colonial dress and they're greeting each other, and the kids are playing with each, with each other, and there's a black man and a white man, and they're shaking hands. Um, looks like a happy greeting. And I said, and then I showed them the page that, go the, that went with that to describe the picture. Mm-hmm. And it said, um, slaves greet their master. Wow. And this was in a textbook. Wow. <laughs> and so what Thomas says is absolutely correct. So not only has history not been taught, it's been manipulated so that um, black kids have trouble even finding out where they are um, in the fabric of this country. Mm-hmm. So he, he, his, his point is, is huge in this. Um, and it leads us to um, where we talk about this point of acting white. Mm-hmm. So there's an author by the name of Stuart Buck who wrote a nonfiction book about Acting White. It's titled Acting, acting white. white. Yeah, saw that. And, mm-hmm. yeah, and um, so he and some other... Uh, scholars have agreed on uh, a theory that they believe is is where we hit the, where the term came to fruition um, in the African American community, and I know for me it's true, and so I just kind of adopted that for the book. Mm-hmm. Before schools integrated, black schools had strong black principals, Eliza Blizzard from the book, um, strong teachers, uh, black educators, at least on a day to day basis, control the curriculum. Mm-hmm. Schools integrated. Black principals lose their jobs, get demoted, whites take over the the um, curriculum, and then all of a sudden we have this tracking thing where, oh, the top students are up here, and I'm I'm not surprised they're all white, right? right. And right. then oh, all the black kids belong down, down here. here at the bottom, mm-hmm. and we all know that the black kids, some of those black kids deserve to be up at the top, but they're not allowed to be. So. What happens if you look at something as the creme de la creme and they tell you you can't be there, you, you're not even born worthy of it, then at a certain point you will rebel against it. Mm-hmm. You'll reject it because if not for no other reason than to just make you feel good about yourself, mm-hmm. you have to be able to live and think exactly. that I'm worthy. And so you reject that. And rejecting that means rejecting the whiteness involved in that. So then if there's one or two black kids who end up in that class, then they moved into the wrong neighborhood. Then if they make friends in that neighborhood, they have the ultimate Uncle Tom and white wannabe and so forth and so on. So this is where the comp where a lot of people believe that it started. I grew up in segregated. I mean, I started in segregated schools. And when I went into this integrated situation, that is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Our phone lines are lit up. So we're going to take a bunch of calls. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Ken joins us from Newport News. Hi, Ken. You're on the air. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I was just curious listening to the story. It's, It's It's heartbreaking, and it does sound somewhat familiar because I've heard of it over the years. But I wonder, in in a story such as this, in this particular book, is there anything that white people can take away from it and learn from? Is there anything in there for us that would be helpful for us to learn? Ken, I'm glad you asked that question. (laughs) No, I'm just laughing because because, uh, Jeffrey and I had talked a little bit about this prior to our our going on the air, so I'm going to let him answer your question. Thanks so much for the call. Uh, Ken, I've I've <laughs> at, at every I have been at um, several events where the audience has been entirely white, and uh, um, but I would say this has come up in most events where someone will stand up and say, "I like the book, I love the story, um, but I it seems to me between African Americans, but 
I want to know what I can do to help and, and how I fit into this. And I explained the very first thing you can do is to fight institutional racism alongside us. Um, because that decreases the, 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 the problem at the top level, if I'd say the umbrella where, where all these problems uh, occur. The second thing is you can reach out. If you know of a child who is in this situation, you can reach out and help that child. I will tell you that um, the former publisher of the Smithfield Times, a man by the name of John Edwards, um, made me his cub reporter, took me under his wing, um, and he's a reason um, I fell in love with journalism. He put me in his car, drove me to Virginia Commonwealth University, introduced me to the powers that be there, mm-hmm. um, because he could. See, he, he, I, saw he, yeah, he saw it. Yeah, he and saw so, it. And so, um, it, it it doesn't you, to help a child. Um, you don't have to be the same color, exactly. and and no goodness offered towards a child is ever wasted. So that's the second thing, and the third thing is to understand that white people are affected by this also. All of us are affected when people withhold their gifts from the world. And if we put people in a situation where they're forced to withhold their gifts, we all lose. If we want to uh, quickly, I'll say, if you think of Charles, Charles A. Drew, a black man who developed what we think of as a blood bank, um, effectively figured out how to store plasma so, right. that y- so that you could give blood, you know, days and weeks and whatever. So the first time this was used in a, a large uh, way was in World War II. So you think of the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of allied soldiers who lived because a black man didn't withhold his gifts. Mm. And we continue to live. Every hospital around the world today uses what Charles A. Drew mm. came up with. We continue to survive with this man's gifts. So when you see as a white person, a black person, a child in this in this way, step in and help any way you can so that that child does not have to give up uh, and his dream and we suffer because we don't have that gift. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ken, for the call. I appreciate it. Candace joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Candace. You're on the air. Hi. Hi, how are you all? Okay, how are you? Good. Go ahead. So You're on I'm, the air. <laughs> okay. I was just really um, intrigued and interested by the topic. Um, I have lived in Norfolk and the Hampton Roads area um, since birth. And I've always been told, you sound like a white girl, you sound like a white girl. So <laughs> I've grown up with it my whole life. Even as an adult, um, it just changes. It's, it's more than to you sound really intelligent or you sound really <laughs> educated, <laughs> which I know what that really means, you know. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, But anyway, I just wanted to say I experienced something early in my childhood that kind of set the tone for the rest of my life in this area. Um I, I lived in Norfolk. My father was in the Navy, so we lived really close to the Norfolk Naval Base. And at my elementary school, um, it was mostly white children, but there were some military kids, so there was a mix as well. So in my community, in my neighborhood, it was mixed. So everyone just was themselves. No one really cared about color. We had all, all the uh, nationalities represented in our neighborhood, but at school, it wasn't that way. And most of my teachers were white. So... The authoritative figures were white, and the kids at school were white. So that kind of overpowered whatever I had going on in the community. Mm. And my mother was very fair-skinned so and spoke very, very intelligently, I'll say. <laughs> uh, sounded like a white girl herself, so, um, unless she got around my family, because she knew how to code switch then. So I picked up on those things, and since my mother spoke this way, and... The school spoke this way and the teacher spoke this way. This must be the way to speak. Mm. I never associated it with color. I just knew this must be the proper way. So as I moved from Norfolk to uh, Virginia Beach, that grew. And -hmm. then we moved to Chesapeake. And it was a more mixed, uh, more black area. And that's when it really came out that that I sound like a white girl. I got you. And that I needed... (laughs) that I needed to blacken up um, or mm. that I needed to stop trying to be like them or why, why can't you just be like us? I don't want to hang with you. I don't think you're down, you know, stuff. This is the early nineties, I would say. Mm. So I felt rejected much like uh, you all were discussing and I didn't know where I fit in. I'm not white. By then I realized that race mattered, you know, to people and that uh, I may not fit in there. I didn't fit in with the black kids. And so I didn't really know what to do. So for a while I struggled and I just kind of kept to myself. 
but I like socializing. So eventually I started, I met a friend and she was white and she was so kind to me. And I just realized, you know, I can just be friends with them then. You know, I'll just yeah. be friends with her friends. Okay, it wasn't even the fact that she was white. It was just I connected. It was just yeah. a connection there. I got you. And yeah, I hate most. to cut you off, but I got to move on because we've got a couple other calls we're going to try to get to. But I'm going to let Jeffrey respond to that because a lot of that is Evan Wall's experience. Right. Absolutely. Um, Go Candace, ahead. You, when you talked about, um, you know, Trying, being, felt, feeling like you needed to go, you know, sit by yourself to get away mm-hmm. from it, or struggling. You were, you were really telling, or helping to tell Evan's story, and I understand entirely what you're saying. Um, I also would just say to you, be yourself. You know, and and one of the one of the wonderful things I had coming from the platform I did with two parents who were very much behind me in education and my brothers, is that um, you know there's strength in who you are and your in your in your your own intellect and and how you see yourself. Just be yourself, and you will find, as Evan did, that there are spaces um, within your African American community where that isn't even a conversation. Um, you know, but you yeah. should, you are in good company. Michelle Obama says the same thing happened Absolutely. to her. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Todd joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Todd. You're on the air. Hello. How are you? Okay. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Good. So, so uh, like, uh, I, I, and the, the last uh, lady that was on, that was pretty much the uh, same experience that uh, I've had uh, uh, coming up. But, you know, not by any particular thing. I just kind of followed what uh, spoke to me. Like I've listened to, you know, like in the, I've, I've listened to rock and roll. I, you know, go skydiving, things like that. Cause that's pretty much what I want to do. But a lot of times I find myself the only black person there. And I try to have these conversations with other black people with me and uh, not necessarily. Mm. However, uh, I, I do have, you know, white friends, and uh, if they're if they're more into the, uh, I've, I've always got the they're, they're they're more blacker than you. If they listen to the rap, if they listen to rap, and if they are, yeah. uh, you know, then yeah. uh, wrong yes. and things like that. But yeah, yeah, that's that's and that that's pretty really much been my experience right there. But uh, like you said, you know, if you just continue to do your thing, uh, you'll find I, I, I have found places where that's not even a conversation. Right, so, because you uh, found people. You know, if, of like mine. I want to speak to you also, and that was, you know, one of the. I thought it was going to be a, you know, enlightening experience, but uh, yeah, it, it was. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the it's, time. Okay. <laughs> Todd, thanks so much for the call. We appreciate that. <laughs> Same thing Same that thing. you were saying. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it just, it goes to show you again, we have a wide variety right. of folks. You know, I mean, I've had, I've had, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Have you ever had um, someone who is not African American say to you, you're not like those other black oh, people? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And that, <laughs> yes. and they think that's a compliment. They think it's a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here to tell you folks, it's not a compliment. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that just, of course, adds to your confusion if you're having walls. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I want to ask you this one mm-hmm. question before we are out of time because we only got five minutes left. I can't believe how fast <laughs> it went by. Um, what would you? What do you say to that? person particularly in our community that's sitting out there listening to us right now and saying why are you airing our dirty laundry i will say because african-american children who are intellectually inclined are killing themselves because they are dealing with this issue the bullying is so bad um, that an eight-year-old in cincinnati recently killed himself two 12-year-old girls two middle school girls took their lives because they were bullied to the point of, of doing so because they liked science and math. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's one thing to have this, uh, a struggle. It's another thing in my mind when our children are taking their lives because of us. And we need to look inside ourselves as a community and recognize that we've reached a point where it's not just a conversation anymore. And once those, those stories start appearing in the paper, the dirty laundry is already out there. Mm-hmm. It's time to have the conversation because it's out there. It's in the papers that these kids are killing themselves and it's in the papers why they're killing themselves. So to pretend that we should keep it in house and, 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 and try to tamp it down over on the side is, is wrong mm-hmm. because 
how many more children will we allow this to happen to? And we, and I want people to understand too. This is not about a socioeconomic no situation. Not this at is all. this is really in terms. I mean, this crosses all socioeconomic levels of the black community. Yes, that where this type of of abuse and bullying right. can go on. But I think something you said most important. You've said it a couple times now is that there is a wide range of thought in the African-American community. And I think we have been, over the, over the years, we've been told um, how we have, we, that, you know, black people sing and dance and, and that's, what we, that's what they do. And so we've been, we've been fighting that and, and, and fighting it all together as one. And it takes a unified mindset sometimes to fight that. Mm-hmm. And then you forget that you don't always have to be unified about thinking about every little thing. There's room to be many different kinds of black people. Um, there's a, a story about it. There's a, a cellist in Washington, D.C. was in the Post. Mm-hmm. And his family thought he was acting outside of his culture and race because he chose the cello. I mean, there has to be room and space for kids to adventure, and to, uh, to dream and to, and to reach out. And it doesn't mean you're not black. Mm-hmm. So after Evans Walls, what's next? I am working on another uh, a book. Um, I'm always afraid to, to, to jinx it by telling the topic. <laughs> but I will tell you that um, um, I think you will find that equally as controversial and that <laughs> okay. we, we're going to have something else good to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. And the next time you come, and you will be coming back yes. <laughs> to join us, we will talk about your career with NBC News. I'd and, be happy to do that. And uh, all the work that you're doing with the with the Post and with, with all those other things. Did you know you had this, this journalism thing inside of you as you were growing up? I didn't until, this, until I went to work at the Smithfield Times. And I, I wrote a letter to the editor, and Mr. Edwards, who was then the managing editor, made me the cub reporter based on that. And then what did I became, you let us say? Well, the, the schools were, there was a big argument in town as to whether or not we needed a new high school. Um, and a lot of, there were some very vocal parent and parents who wrote some negative, in my mind, negative letters to the editor saying that the, we don't need a new high school because these kids can't take care of the school they have. Oh. So some friends and I got together and came up with some bullet points and I wrote a very thoughtful and angry <laughs> Letter to the editor, and Mr. Edwards said, "Oh, there's some talent here. How would you oh, like to be our fantastic. cub reporter?" And that was the that was the beginning. That's fantastic, yeah. Jeffrey Blunt. It has been a true pleasure talking it's, with you it's today. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, and we will be right back. I'm with Marcellus, and you all are checking out another view. Don't go anywhere. Check us out. And welcome back. We hear a lot about what life was like for the enslaved living in the 16, 17, and 1800s. But rarely do we hear what it was like to be a free person of color during that time. Well, if you've ever been curious, you're about to meet one such person. His name is John Rollison. And thanks to actor James Cameron, we're now able to take a closer look at the life of this 18th century free black man. John Rollison was not only a free person of color in 18th century Virginia, he was also one of the most successful people of that time. So when given the opportunity to sit down with this entrepreneur, patriot, and slave owner, I jumped at the chance. Here was a man of color who was very respected, signer of the Committee for Allegiance, along with Patrick Henry, Thomas Nelson Jr., had lots in Williamsburg, had acreages of land, had a large tavern, and was a master shoemaker. With the help of actor James Cameron, who has spent thousands of hours researching Rollison and more than a decade portraying him, I got to hold a conversation with this man from York County who was born free in 1723. You own slaves. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, let me first say that slavery is an abomination. And if our heavenliest of fathers is a creature of justice, he certainly cannot find justice in this practice. But let me also say that I am a man of this planet, and they are laws. And with these laws, it is not permitted for me to free or manumit my slaves. So I am sort of, as you would say, in a quandary. I try as best I can to treat them as my family. 
Uh, for example, before our revolutionary insurgents, if they wanted to go to the marketplace and sell their wares. Well, of course, upon the Sabbath day, of course, I would more than permit them to go and to be able to earn ranis and to be able to have a small area of land themselves where they could plant and grow food for their own families. So I have tried to do the best I can under the parameters in which I have been given. And what were their tasks at your tavern or on your land? Oh, well, of course I moved them around as I needed them. For example, uh, in 17 and uh, 79, I fed the Gloucester militia in my tavern, 10 diets. And so my wife, along with uh, three, uh, I believe, of uh, my enslaved, helped in the preparation of the meals uh, for those militiamen. So I would move them around as I needed them, and also for my acreage of farming for my tobacco and uh, corn, wheat, barley, soybeans, and uh, various things of that nature. Even though Rollison owned hundreds of acres of land and several businesses, this prominent, well-respected husband and father still fell short when it came to governing power. Because I am mulatto, I am mixed blood, my father being white, my mother mulatto as myself, I am not allowed to be part of the governing body. I cannot hold a political office, nor can I vote. So uh, hopefully, now that we are fighting for our liberation with our Declaration of Independency, that these laws eventually will be put down. John Rollison died the equivalent of a modern-day millionaire in 1780, leaving his wealth to his children. But you can learn more about his life next Wednesday at the Williamsburg Library Theater. Annette Brown is moderating the event. We feel we simply don't know enough about our history. There are gaps in our history, and we know that. And we're just simply attempting to try to fill in some of those gaps. And we're trying to bring it out into the open that these people did exist, that our history is much fuller than what was presented to us, and that we can take confidence and pride in that history. I hope that they go back saying, wow, I didn't know this. This is amazing. And what I also hope is that they decide to really look into their own family tree. What by knowing my past will help me in my today and my future? And what can I pass on to my children? For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And James Cameron will portray John Rollison for two performances in February at the Williamsburg Library Theater on Wednesday, February 5th and Wednesday, February 19th. Both performances are at 7 p.m. Thank you so much for spending an hour of your life with us. If you'd like to hear this show again or share it with a friend, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. And as I've been telling you for the past couple of weeks, our email went a little bit wonky with our eView newsletter. So if you have subscribed in the past, please go back to our website, anotherviewradio.org, and re-sign up for the newsletter so that we can send it to you. It is a a once-a-week reminder of upcoming shows. And don't forget, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next week, Norfolk Police Department Chief Larry Boone with an update on his Guns Down program, why the killing of young African-American males has become a public health issue. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And... Lisa also answered our phones today. (laughs) I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Be sure to tune in next Thursday at noon for another view. (laughs) 